Hi, hello. I am the Cyber Roof Guru. Thank you so much for watching. I've been doing a lot of epoxy work recently. I've made a full-size desk, I've made a smaller desk that ultimately became a table, and I've completed a wide range of pours for some charcuterie boards and some cutting boards. I have a lot of experience pouring and finishing epoxy, but sometimes experience can't save you from yourself. One of my recent pours went completely sideways, but not in the normal way. Usually when I screw up in an epoxy pour, it results in a ton of wasted epoxy leaking everywhere, and in some cases, me replacing my entire CNC wasteboard. Today, I'm gonna to share with you my recent whoopsie, explain what went wrong, how I fixed it, and some of the testing I did to avoid the problem in the future. All right, first, some background on my recent epically failed epoxy pour. At a recent craft fair, we sold a beautiful checkered cutting board. The customer said that it was a wedding gift and asked if we can engrave the names of the bride and groom on the cutting board. We routinely customize products for our Etsy customers and we love doing the same for our customers at craft fair. I think it provides that little extra level of personalization that makes a product truly one of a kind and endearing to the recipient. If you are interested in personalized items, I encourage you to check out our Etsy store, Flying Ninja Woodworks, and see how we can make that special item for you or a family member. I will leave a link to the store below. In this specific case, the customer wanted the cutting board to be engraved and filled with epoxy. The original idea was to use their wedding colors for the epoxy pour, which was blue, but she ultimately decided to go with pure black for the best contrast. When doing projects like this, I use my Onefinity CNC to perform the engraving, and then I seal the wood using a clear epoxy and a disposable brush. The goal is to stop the colored epoxy from bleeding into the wood during the final pour. The process usually works very well, and I've done it many times before without any issues. It's worth noting at this point that the cutting board was completely finished and ready to be used. It had been finished with mineral oil and beeswax, and because of this, I had to sand the surface clean before pouring the epoxy to ensure that the oil didn't interact with the epoxy in some weird way. I sanded it down to the bare wood and pressed on with the project. By the time I got around to pouring the epoxy, I was a little pressed for time, so I didn't let the seal coat cure completely. Instead, I let it set up for about two hours until it was tacky and poured the black epoxy. It's worth noting that I've used this partial cure technique before and not had any problems. Well, when I hit the epoxy with the heat gun this time to remove the bubbles, I immediately saw something that didn't look right. The epoxy on top immediately started to separate as the oil from the wood started rising to the surface. It was like oil on water. The epoxy literally started pooling on top of the oil. I immediately got that sinking feeling in my stomach as I knew something was wrong. I looked closely at the pour and the engraving and they looked fine. There was no pooling and no signs of any oil coming from the wood around the engraving site. At this point, I figured the seal coat had cured enough and everything would be fine. Well, I was wrong. Very wrong. After sanding the overpour off, my worst nightmare was revealed. The black epoxy had bled into the surrounding wood, creating black streaks into the cherry. Now, this is not necessarily the first time I got some bleeding, but this specific engraving was fairly narrow and much of the lettering was not very deep. I continued to sand, seeing if I could remove the bleed mark. In the process, I sanded right through the black epoxy in many areas, leaving broken letters throughout the engrave. It looked horrible and was completely unacceptable for a paying customer, or any customer for that matter. At this point, I had a serious choice to make. Do I attempt to fix it by redoing the engrave and praying that I could align the CNC to the exact same position? Or do I start over with a new board? Well, as luck would have it, I actually made a few of these same boards so thankfully, I had a spare. Normally, I don't make more than one of any board, so this was very fortunate indeed. Rather than redoing the carve, having it fail, and having to start all over again, I simply just started over with a fresh board. 
This time I made the engrave a little bit wider and a little bit deeper, and I made sure the pre-pour was fully cured before the final pour. While pouring, I also made sure that I didn't get any of the black epoxy on the unsealed parts of the wood. Fortunately, this one went off without a hitch and the customer loved the results. Luck was definitely on my side with this one. After finishing the project, I stepped back and regrouped a little bit. I've seen many different approaches to sealing wood on the interwebs, but I didn't know which ones were the most effective and which ones could have saved my first failed engrave. So I set out to test a couple different approaches and evaluate the results in terms of effectiveness, time, and cost. After some pondering, I decided to test using epoxy as I've done in the past, also using sanding sealer, and then using shellac. I will also test the epoxy fully cured and partially cured, as well as do a control of completely unsealed wood. To start the process, I created a test piece in Fusion 360 that had five different areas, one for each one of the tests. I wanted to test a pocket where the wood fibers would be exposed from various angles, so I decided to use the letter S that would expose straight grain, cross grain, and angles in between. I made the pocket 1 8 of an inch deep, which is usually the depth I use for epoxy pours. To gather some additional data points, I decided to conduct the same test in four different types of hardwood, poplar, hard maple, cherry, and walnut. Aside from poplar, the other woods are the ones that I use most frequently in projects and the ones that I'm most likely to engrave or fill with epoxy. I threw poplar into the mix because I happened to have a piece in the garage and I was a little curious if it would be different from the other hardwoods. Though poplar is officially a hardwood, it isn't nearly as hard as the other woods with a jank of score of only 540. By contrast, cherry is 950, walnut is 1010, almost twice as hard as poplar, and maple is 1440, just over two and a half times harder than poplar. I used my trusty Onefinity to mill the pockets. I used a 1 8 inch down cut spiral end mill, a 1 8 inch depth of cut, and a feed rate of 80 inches per minute. After all the cuts were made, I did a little bit of cleanup in areas where there were fuzzies left. All the pockets looked great, so I started the sealing process. I started with sanding sealer, then I moved to shellac, and then the epoxy that would cure for 24 hours. The next day, I sealed the final pocket and let it cure for just over an hour. I used Total Boat High Performance Epoxy with Medium Hardener for all the pours. That is my go-to epoxy for shallow pours that need to harden overnight. For deeper pours, I've been using super clear liquid glass and getting amazing results. I will leave a link to both below in the description. After a day of curing, I lightly planed the pieces to reveal the outcome. I could have surfaced the pieces with the CNC in my fly cutter, which I highly recommend if you do a lot of flattening, but since the pieces were different thicknesses, the planer was just a little bit easier. Okay, if you've made it this far, I'm guessing you want to see the results. Now, before I show you the results, I want to talk a little bit about the wood that I used and some of my general observations during the testing. First, the test pieces all had the same grain direction except for maple. Somehow it runs vertically rather than horizontally like the rest of the wood, so any bleeding you might see will run vertically rather than horizontally like the other wood species. Second, I intentionally chose a piece of walnut that has both heartwood and sapwood. I wanted to see if there was any difference between the bleeding in the different parts of the tree. Finally, I tried to correct the color and brightness of the pictures so all of them looked as close to what my eyes see. I did the best that I could, but they're not all 100% perfect despite being taken under the same conditions. For my observations, it's no surprise the unsealed pocket showed the most amount of bleed. However, I was very struck by how much bleeding happened with the sealed samples. Secondarily, I found the varying degrees of bleeding based on species of wood also very interesting. Finally, I only put one coat of all the sealants. This will become notable later in the video. Okay, without any further ado, let's go ahead and dig in. What you see here are all the unsealed samples placed side by side and oriented by species. Poplar is first, then cherry, then maple, and finally walnut. All the pictures will have the wood in the same order and the same orientation. In this test, all the species had some amount of bleeding as expected. 
The poplar is perhaps the worst of all, with walnut being the best. Such that it is. There's not a lot to say here other than don't pour colored epoxy on unsealed wood. Next, we have the sample where I sealed the wood with the epoxy and let it cure for just over an hour. As you can see, the results are much better than the unsealed version, but they are not perfect by any stretch. In this case, maple and walnut are nearly perfect, but poplar and cherry had some amount of bleeding. I was very surprised by the amount of bleeding on the cherry in particular. I expected it to have similar results as the walnut since they are close in hardness. Perhaps since the walnut is darker in color, it somehow masked some of the amount of bleeding where the cherry did not. Certainly the maple provided the best results in this test. In the next sample, the wood is sealed with the epoxy that cured for an entire day. As you can see, the results are essentially perfect. Zero bleed across all the woods. The one thing I will note, however, you can see the engraved names are full of cured clear epoxy. If I had poured the black epoxy there, you would undoubtedly see a lot of burn through where the clear epoxy filled the engraving and the color epoxy didn't penetrate. So if you're doing a lot of fine details, a thick epoxy seal coat might not be your best course. Okay, next, we're getting into the results that surprised me the most. Here is the sanding sealer. I was really shocked by the amount of bleeding on all the wood species. I have used sanding sealer before with paint and I've never had this level of bleeding. I am wondering if the longer cure time for the epoxy versus paint allowed more of the pigments to penetrate the sealer. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, I only applied one coat of the sanding sealer, so I'm wondering if more than one coat would have provided better results. Perhaps we can do a follow-up video. If that's something you're interested in, please leave your comments down below. Now is also a good time to say if you're finding value in this video, please consider hitting that like button. The last set of results is shellac, which many people on the internet recommend for sealing wood and stopping bleeding. Once again, I was very surprised by the results. Here, only walnut escaped without bleeding. All the other species showed some degree of bleeding, with poplar certainly being the worst. In fact, the sealed version of poplar bled almost as much as the unsealed version, which is really odd. Once again, I'm wondering if a second or maybe even a third coat would have helped. As an aside, my shellac is rather old and I believe shellac does degrade over time, so perhaps that influenced the results here. Again, more reasons to conduct a second round of testing. I did notice when I applied both the sanding sealer and the shellac, the poplar seemed to absorb them a lot more than any of the other woods. That certainly begs the question if an additional coat or two would have helped. The final picture here shows all of the tests side by side. Clearly poplar is the universal loser with only the well-cured epoxy providing protection. Generally, the walnut is the universal winner, showing the least signs of bleeding of all the woods. Maple is probably in second place, with cherry being third. I was fully expecting maple to fare worst, giving its light color, but I guess its additional hardness allowed it to fare better than most. In terms of which method worked best, well, the fully cured epoxy seal coat clearly provided the best overall results, hands down. The short cure epoxy worked for some woods, but not all, which is a little disappointing. I was very shocked at about how poorly the sanding sealer performed and the shellac came somewhere in between the middle. In the end, if you want guaranteed success, a fully cured epoxy seal is certainly the best. That said, I believe redoing the test with more coats of sanding sealer and shellac is certainly warranted. Specifically, given the heavy cost of epoxy over something like shellac, anything less expensive would get my vote if it performs equally well. I will post my test files on my website, CRG Makes, for anyone who wants to run their own tests or try variants that might provide better or different results. Before you mill your test pieces, avoid common CNC mistakes by watching this video right here. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for getting this far. And don't forget to be inspired.